Last time we were together, we talked about the one critical ingredient for mission service. Do you remember what it was? Willingness. That was the main one. And I want to read to you just to re-emphasize the importance of it and why that's such a critical ingredient. You can find this quote, and it's such an encouragement to me, in Christ Object Lessons, page 333. It says, As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. It says, Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. This is what I want you to remember. I want you to remember these last words because they're crucial. All his biddings are enablings. You see, as you cooperate with God, he has the capability to give and add on the rest. So the most crucial ingredient to mission service is willingness. You ever ask yourself, well then, why me? Why does God choose me? So, so, I mean, I understand, okay, so he can power me and give me the strength to do these things. But have you ever wondered why he chooses us? You know, I used to think about that, too, quite a bit. Well, why does God, why doesn't he just use something else? Why doesn't he use angels? Why does he, you know, if he's going to do this thing, why does he choose us? I want to read a, a verse to you. And uh, we're going to look in our Bibles in Luke. And uh, Luke chapter 9, verse, uh, we're going to start in 23. And then we're going to read on to 24. It says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That's interesting. You know, God calls us as, as, as Christians to come and what? Deny ourselves. Take up our cross and to follow him. You know, I like to tell people, Christianity isn't a spectator sport. It's not something we go and do and sit and assimilate. It's not a spectator sport, but it's something we participate in. And, uh, but I ask myself, okay, so God, you want us to be a part of what you're doing. You want us to do this mission service, but why is it so hard sometimes? Why is it full of challenges and difficulties. Why is it a cross? Why us? And, uh, you know, those are good questions because I'll tell you, you know, mission service isn't easy. I didn't say that, you know, being willing to do it, that's the most important thing, sure. But, it, you know, you, when you start and you're like, man, all these challenges and all these difficulties, all these impossibilities... Why do I have to deny myself? Why? Well, that's, those are all good questions. And I'm going to answer some of those questions in our topic tonight. Why does God use us? Well, let's turn now to Revelation, the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 17. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, and we're going to, we're in this, if you're familiar with Revelation, you have the seven churches at the beginning of it, and each church is kind of a prophecy, is a prophecy of the condition of the church in successive generations and um, ages. And uh, we're going to find ourselves here in Laodicea, and it says unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, verse 14, right, these things saith the Amen the faithful and true witness, the beginning of, creation, of the creation of God. <clears throat> I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold, or cold nor hot, excuse me. I will, so then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, 
I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now that's interesting. Okay, so we see this, this condition of the Laodicean church, which is our church today. We are rich and increased with goods, and it's not just material goods, it's spiritual goods. We're wealthy. We have the truth. We have the Word of God. We think we've got it all together. You see, when I go as a missionary, I think I've got it all together. I'm a missionary. I'm doing service for God. I'm going down there and I'm going to preach the message to those indigenous people. I'm going to save lives. When I got there, I realized that the situation was far, far different than what I imagined. You see, the problem of Laodicea is a very dangerous one because why? Because they don't know it. You see, I'm going to tell you, I hate going to the doctor. I've never, hardly ever been to the doctor. I don't go. I would have to be on my deathbed for me to even consider visiting a doctor's office. I'm petrified of them. Much, I don't care too much for dentists, don't care for doctors, just a phobia that I have. Now, I ask you, if I was really sick, really, 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 really sick, and I would barely go to the doctor then, how do you think I would do it if I didn't have any symptoms? Do you think I would go? Just for a checkup? If I have nothing wrong, hey, no, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm not going to the doctor. Why would I go? No. You see, that's the danger of the Laodicean church. You see, they don't sense, sense their need. They don't, they don't see it. So if they have a big problem and they can't sense their need... How do they get fixed? How will they get cured? You know, we don't have a, there's no, there's no uh, physician. They don't, they don't see it. So, so as you read this, this is a very dangerous, dangerous problem. We have the same problem. Do you know that? But you know, I'm so thankful that in the Word of God, God didn't leave the Laodicean church without a solution to their problem. And I want to read it with you. Let's read it. And it says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, verse 17, and thou knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, blind and naked, I counsel thee. Buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. You know, the second two ones I can kind of see. I understand pretty good. White raiment, what does white raiment represent in the Bible? Well, that represents the righteousness of Christ. We need to put on Christ's righteousness so that we can have his, his righteous acts in our lives. He needs to live out in us. I have the Holy Spirit. What is the job of the Holy Spirit? It convicts us. It shows us our needs so that we can see, we can see our own deficiencies. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But then what's gold tried in the fire? Well, that one, I'm not so sure about. I, can't, I haven't th thought about that too much. That's not real common to me. But let's look at something in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. What is gold tried in the fire? Turn with me to your Bibles now. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. And the Word of God says that the trial of your faith, 
being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with my fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trial of your what? Your faith. Your faith. The trial of your faith is as gold tried in the fire. Trials? Difficulties? Why? Why do we have to have those? Well, it helps us see our real condition. It helps us see our real condition. I'll tell you, as you you make that choice to serve God wherever it goes, I know it won't be easy, but he gives us that opportunity to be co-laborers with him. Why? Because we need it. We need that experience. We need it. You know, like I said, when I went down as a missionary, I thought I kind of had things together. I thought I was kind of a good person. I thought, well, you know, well, now that I've had that Cole Porter experience back in the day, and I went to Southern and I studied theology, and I thought, well, now I'm a theologian and I'm graduated from there and I want to serve the Lord and I'm going as a missionary overseas. Doesn't that sound like a really good person to you? Well, I thought it seemed like it. And then I got there. And I got there and I realized some things like different things that chafe us. Are there things that chafe you? I mean, like, kind of irritate you? Sometimes it's people. Sometimes it's something that something happens or something that somebody does. You know, quotes, nails on the chalkboard. Let me tell you. When I got to Bolivia, one of the things that I found that really, really bothered me, you wouldn't believe it, but it's mechanics. You know, I I didn't have problems with people. People could, you know, have different issues, but those didn't get to my character so much like really get under your skin as much as wrenching on things. Man, I just, we, when I got down to this school in the middle of the bush, it was interesting. I could find no mechanics to come help us. We bought some equipment. We bought a truck. We bought a backhoe. We had a rototiller. We had this old Jeep Willie. Uh, we had a little uh, Land Cruiser. We had mowers. And we, we started collecting tools and generators. Because this is way out in the middle of the bush. The Lord is blessing us. However, you know, um, a motorcycles. But I couldn't find anybody to help maintain these things. And it turned out that I felt like I was more the director of maintenance and really a director of the school. I just wrenched and worked on all this busted equipment all the time as opposed to uh, doing anything directly with the school as much as just trying to fix things. And, you know, I'll tell you, the problem is with mechanics and patience is both of those. You need to be a patient person to be a mechanic. And I realized, well, I'm not a very patient person. And so when things break and things go wrong, my blood boils. And, you know... I'll tell you, that's just enough to make a, you know, there's a, there's a term, to this, enough to make a saint swear. And well, let me tell you, the mechanics fits that phrase for me. You know, and so I remember days, a couple of days where, where I would walk down the road, boiling, muttering, and angry with God. Why am I always wrenching on all these things? Why do I have to work on all this stuff? And I'd, wa- I'd be walking to catch the bus. Because the motorcycle was broke, because the car was broke, because the, the, bu- the truck was broke. Everything was broke. And I'm a terrible mechanic, but the Lord sent me to do mechanics in this bush. Wanted to teach me a lesson. You know, sometimes God asks us to do things that we're not good at. Why? Because we need that to see who we really are. You see, God sends things in our life. He sends trials in our lives to develop us, to develop patience. Well, I'll tell you, some people like to tell me, well, you know, I ask people not to pray for patience for me. No, I don't. don't. I know how that comes, right? And you know how patience comes? I don't know if you know how patience comes, but let's look it up in, 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 uh, in uh, the book of James. The book of James, you're familiar with this one. James chapter 1, it says, My brethren, 
Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. All joy? I don't know about you, but how many of you guys woke up this morning and said, Hey, hey Lord, I'm ready for some trials. Yeah, it's a trial! Woo! Do we do that? I'm so excited today, I've got another trial! Man, just can't wait. Are we that way? No, no, normally it's like, ah, oh, man, Lord, do you always have to make it hard? We whine, you know. I don't know if any of you have kids, but, you know, kids are good at that, and I think we're God's children, and boy, are we good at whining. But James says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation, knowing this. Knowing what? That the trying of your faith produces what? Patience. It produces patience. You see, when we're tried like gold in the fire, when we go through these difficult experiences, it produces patience. And I'm going to come back to why patience is so critical. But you see, we need these experiences. That's why God calls us to be collaborators with him. And if you get a chance to read a book, a chapter of this book, read the chapter on the work and the life in the book Steps of Christ. I want to encourage you, read that chapter. God could have chosen angels, but he chose us. He gave us that privilege to be co-laborers with him. It's an honor. It's a privilege. Even though it's full of difficulties, those difficulties have a purpose. God uses those. I'll tell you, when I started out as a missionary, people would ask me, well, you know, how, what, what if something happens to your family while you're over there? And of course, working in aviation, what happens if you had some sort of an accident? What happens if something would happen to you? What are you going to do? And, uh, you know, I thought about those things and I said, well, you know, uh, I guess the Lord will work some of those things out. I don't know. And I want to tell you that all the many of those worst case scenarios have happened in my life. And I, I'm going to share a couple of those experiences with you. And, um, you know, I know that the Lord has used those to develop my character and has used those to be a testimony to what God can do. Please don't ask any more what ifs, though. I want to phrase that because, whew, I don't want to go in through any one of those worst case scenarios, okay? So, uh, the first one, what if something happens to one of your families? You know, and I thought, oh, man. My wife, my first child we had, we had her at home in Montana. My sister-in-law is a midwife. We had her at home, and uh, you know everything went smooth out of this beautiful, my in-law's house out there in the, in the mountains of Montana. It was wonderful. I mean, it was a, a wonderful experience, and uh, my baby, was, our baby, baby girl was born, and she was healthy. You know, no, no problems. It was, everything seemed to go just smooth as could be. We were gone a month or two, and then right back down to the mission field, we went. Everything fine. Everybody's, oh, you're going to take your baby back down the mission field? Yeah. God can take, protect her here just as easy as he can protect her there. We want to be where God wants us to be. That's the most important thing. So we went back down to the mission field. And we were there a few more years, and lo and behold, another baby is on the way. My wife's pregnant. And I thought, you know, this is going to be no problem. We've got everything together. The last one went really smooth. And so... Um, we, we, were, we were just not expecting to have any issues. And then the school was getting ready. We were stressed out about getting teachers in. You know, at the beginning of the school year, we never had enough teachers, and we were worried about that. And three days before the school year started, a Friday night at 10 o'clock at night, my wife is 25 weeks pregnant, and her water breaks, and she starts labor. Now, that's kind of a tough spot. We're about 500 miles away from any decent health care. We're in the middle of kind of a, eh, it has some drug trafficking, so flying at night is something that I don't normally do. In fact, I hadn't done to that point. And we don't even have a lit runway there. And we're still 
about an hour away from that town. We're about an hour away. We've still, I got to get into, get her into that town. So I hop on a motorcycle and I rush into town. They throw my wife on the truck and I start waking up all the people, the control tower, the drug people, everybody. And I start calling civil agents. I need, I'm going to, I'm going to take my wife out of there that night. And they were like, well, we don't know. I said, I don't know. I, I, I don't care what their laws say. I'm leaving. And so the, uh, nobody would really want to let me file a flight plan. They called the people, and they knew I was coming, but nobody wanted to sign anything. I said, drug people, you look at the plane. Make sure there, you, you give me a, a stamp that said there's no drugs on this plane. That's all I want you to do. So they stamped my, my manifest. I put my wife in there, and I remember that night they put two motorcycles on the side of that runway, and when I took off that night, and my nose lifted off and lost the lights of that town, I flew into the abyss. There was nothing. There was no lights. We live in a very remote area, and there's just jungle, and you just fly along, and you just listen to the hum of that little single-engine airplane, boring along as you go 500 miles to the next town. I did not see a single light from there. It was a moonless, starless, pitch black night the whole way there. I have my wife sitting in the back. She's in labor, and I'm asking myself, is my, our baby going to die? Is she going to make it? Is my wife going to make it? had no idea. Very stressful moment for my life. We landed in that big city, and they rushed her off to the hospital, and they did some different interventions. And, of course, I'm not much of a medical dude, but my wife, they did a cesarean, and my wife, my, my baby was born, our baby, baby girl. And it seemed like everything was going to actually work out okay. She got out of the neonatal ICU and she went up into the main uh, area and I thought she, she didn't even need a respirator when she got out, a ventilator or respirator, I don't know what they call those things. Anyway, she didn't need anything and she got out there and she went, she was in the, just the, I don't know, what the maternity ward, wherever they put all the rest of the babies in normal state and uh, things seemed to be going good. She was drinking milk, she was gaining weight, everything looked good. She was born really small and she would fit in my hand. And then all of a sudden, she got sick. She got uh, something called uh, neck, and uh, then she, then with the medicines, boy, everything just started going down, 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 down. She went back. She was on a respirator. She had lines all out of her. I don't know. I don't know what they do. And she was back in neonatal ICU. She was there for two months. At the same time, at the same time, so this is kind of a stressful event, wondering, uh, and we had her in the best clinic we could put her in. I, didn't, I, I said, you know, God, if I was working somewhere, I would put her in the best opportunity that I have, doing all that I can. I'm flying at the same time. I'd come home late from a flight, and we'd drive over to the ICU to see our little girl. And I'll tell you, I did not believe that she was going to make it. I thought, you know, we are going to bury our little child here in Bolivia. And, uh, but I'll tell you, God was merciful, and she did. She recuperated. She finally started getting better and better and better, and she finally recuperated. And today she's four years old, four plus, and just an active, lively little girl that you would have never known was born so small. And that whole story, you know, as that, as that all the, the end of that solution, that happened in, in 2008, in that same year, in that same year, uh, we had a lot of the, the, the school, because I was directing the school, I had to leave. I had to be in a different town. I would go back down there, and it seemed like everything was going to fall apart. But yet God held it together. It's his school. It's his, it's his thing. And I learned to lean on the mighty arm of our Heavenly Father. But I'll tell you, that's not the end of that. That year, I felt like Job. That year, that same year, we were doing a missions congress up in a, in a place in, uh, in Mexico, and we had took a bunch of volunteer missionaries up there to, to uh, do uh, presentations to inspire young people to get out there and serve. And on the way back after that Missions Congress, it was really a blessing. Many young people were interested and in, started getting involved in that. And on the way back, we landed in Guatemala, and we were getting ready to head back down to Bolivia. That night, we had taken off to land in Colombia. That was our one stop before we went back to the next site. And, uh, you know, it, it was, everything seemed normal. Everything seemed okay. We, we got all in the plane. We took off. We got up to altitude, and we were just flying along. You know, and as we were flying along, you know, as you fly in airplanes a lot, you get used to looking at what everything is, what all the dials are telling you, 
what everything will, you like to see everything normal. But you know, you always got a little nervousness in your stomach. What if something happened? What about the weather? What about these different events? And as we were flying, uh, I realized that my engine had lost oil pressure. Now, you know, engines without oil pressure, it's kind of a problem. And by the way, as a pilot, single engine uh, airplanes, the kind of the worst case scenario, there's two of them. Uh, one is uh, engine failure at night. The other is engine failure IFR. And, uh, you know, in, in the States, we fly these, both of those uh, single engine airplanes like that all the time. But it's kind of their, their worst case scenario. And engine failure at night, there's a joke that goes around like, you know, if you have engine failure at night, when you're getting ready to land, turn your landing light on. And if you like what you see, leave it on. And if you don't like it, well, just turn it right back off. And, you know, that's the joke. Anyway, we, uh, we had this, this problem, and I, uh, you know, I declared emergency. We deviated towards the nearest airport, and I realized that I wouldn't make it. And so we began to circle for an unlit runway. And as we circled, I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. And I was praying. I was asking the Lord, help that runway to be in front of me. And so as the last time, as I was getting ready to circle around, and I started, I set up for a regular landing, and I put the landing gear down, and I tried to aim in the direction where I thought that runway might be, and then tried to find a dark spot. Right near it was a town. I didn't want to land on houses. I didn't want to hurt anybody else. I wanted to try and land in a dark, dark spot where I thought there would be no one. Could see nothing. And we started to descend and descend and descend. I was praying that the runway would be in front of me. And as my landing lights started lighting up, as they lit up what was below me, it wasn't the runway. It was trees. What do you do? Nothing. You just let the airplane settle into the trees and try and get it as slow as you possibly can. And we settled in and, and you could feel the, the, the jerks and the jars and, and all of a sudden everything was quiet. Nothing. You couldn't see anything except for just a little light from a battery-operated GPS that I had sitting in front of me. I grabbed my flashlight. I looked out my left window, and the left wing was completely gone. I looked out the right window, and there was fuel gushing from my wing. And so I quickly told the passengers how to open up the emergency exit. We got out, and I, we drug the other passenger out, and we rushed them all. And, and there was people nearby. We put them. I called them over to help us. They brought a vehicle, and all the, all the passengers were in the hospital in about... 15 minutes of landing, of crashing. The next day, I went out there to look at the site. And uh, there, were, there were media people all around and reporters asking me questions and, and wanting to know what happened and how things happened. And, and I, uh, I couldn't say anything. I was speechless. I was looking at the, where I landed because it was the middle of the night. I was looking at where I landed and I couldn't believe it. I, I actually landed in a subdivision right in front of the nose of the airplane. About 20, about 30 more feet was a house, a whole row of houses with a street. And I landed in these people's backyard kind of farm area. And I thought, well, how did I get in there? How did I land in such, there was only probably around three 400 feet of room to land. That airplane takes 3,000 feet to take off. How did I get in such a small area? I was looking for the hole in the trees or all those things, and I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. And I finally realized that the trees that I thought I settled into was a tree. It was a mango tree. I had clipped the top of the mango tree and that had slowed me down enough to put me in that little postage stamp of a garden 500 feet short of the runway. No one was killed in that accident. I still don't know why that runway wasn't in front of me. But I do know that God knows and I know that God has a plan. Even if it was a mistake of mine, you go back through and you can analyze all these things and you can say, well, you know, you really messed up here or you could have messed up there. And that's fair. That's fair. 
But you know, God is so gracious. He's a gracious God. And I am thankful that he is able to fix any things that we mess up. And even though in these intense moments of trial and difficulty, we have a mighty arm to lean on. If we wait on him, he calls us to be co-laborers with him. If you don't want to have difficulties and things, don't do anything. You can try. But God uses those to, to train us and to prepare us for his kingdom. We need gold tried in the fire. But you notice interesting something that it says? It says buy. It says buy of me gold tried in the fire. Why? We have to choose it. Are we willing to choose? Are we willing you see, we need that experience. God knows we need it because that's what prepares us for his kingdom. Gold tried in the fire. I just want to encourage each one of you today as you look at the challenges and difficulties in your life, as you want are tempted to shrink from a duty or a job or a calling that seems difficult, Remember Luke. Remember Revelation 3.17 and 18. Remember James. Trials are going to come. There will be difficulties. But the beauty of it is you're not alone. Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He loves us. He only gives us those because it's the only solution to our problem. It's the only way we'll see our need of him. It's the only way we'll run to him and cling on his mighty arm. See, we really are nothing. But do you, have you experienced him? Have you experienced his power? Have you seen that in your life? I have. I've seen him do miracles. Nobody can tell me that God doesn't exist. Nobody can tell me that Jesus doesn't work for us today. I believe he does. And I've seen it, and I see it every day. Are you willing to take up your cross and follow him? I want to read that verse one more time. Luke 9, 23 and 24. It says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Friends, I tell you this today because I want you to have life. I want you to have life, life eternal. Are you willing to take up your cross and follow him? That's my prayer for each one of us today.